in section eight of this class on the philosophy of economics, we are coming to an exciting new development of economics. New means regarding the last five decades or so. It's experimental economics and it is something about which, for instance, Milton Friedman in the 1950s could not even think about as a possibility, namely systematic experimentation in economics. Um, the literature, the central text I'm using here is from Francesco Guala, Experimentation in Economics. It's in uh, the edition by Uskali Meki on philosophy of economics and there uh, it's some 40 pages. Uh, Francesco Guala is one of the really leading experts on uh, experimental economics as far as the um, meta uh, discussion, the methodology, methodological discussion is concerned. Uh, he's written also a book on that already in 2005. And here's a supplementary text that concerns the history of experimental economics, and that's available in the new Palgrave Dictionary of Economics. And it's only a short piece from 2018, but it gives uh, some information about the historical development. And I shall use that in my uh, subsection then on the historical development of um, experimental economics. Here's the outline. <clears throat> I begin uh, by some historical remarks, which may be useful to get some sort of perspective um, of uh, experimental uh, economics, how it developed and how it came into being. And then the next step is an important distinction. It's the distinction between experiment versus observation. Sometimes that's used as if they were the same, but they are not. And observation uh, and experiment are different. So it's important to see what the specifics of experiments are. Then uh, this is a concept that comes from psychology, internal versus external validity. And that concerns um, a kind of assessment of experiments in two different respects. It's very important in all experimental disciplines um, and also in experimental economics. The next step will be a five-fold classification of experiments. So in five different respects, one can distinguish different kinds of experiments. And you will not understand at this point really what I mean to say here in the first classification, distance to reality. But I'm claiming that experiments may be further apart or nearer to reality. And therefore, we can classify them roughly by their distance to reality. The second aspect of classification is uh, the point of controlled experiments versus uncontrolled experiments in some sense. I'm going to explain that. And the third classification concerns different purposes of experiments. And there are two main groups that I'm going to explain. The fourth classification concerns a difference between intended versus unintended experiments, which may sound strange at the beginning, but I'm going to explain it to you. And finally, the last classification concerns literal experiments versus metaphorical experiments. And it's also important to see that, that uh, sometimes we speak about experiments in a metaphorical way, and it's important to identify these uses and not mistake them for the literal uses. So I begin with historical remarks. Now, as I said already, experimentation is a comparatively new phenomenon in economics. And comparatively new means, for instance, that in the 19th century, most economists, including John Stuart Mill, thought that experiments in economics were practically impossible. This was also the source uh, for some theoreticians um, uh, to be um, pessimistic about the state of, of the scientific state of economics because it was impossible to do experiments in economics. And therefore, the status of physics, for instance, or chemistry, in which uh, experiments were possible, could not be reached without these experiments. This was a sentiment that was very common among people. Uh, so it was seen also with a whiff of pessimism that experiments were practically impossible in economics. <clears throat> 
Similar still in the 1950s, now this is a big step uh, to, in fact, the beginning then of experimental economics. Milton Friedman in 1953, in his uh, famous article that I dealt with in an earlier section, said, unfortunately, we can seldom test particular predictions in the social sciences by experiment. And um, the, uh, Friedman drew some consequences, not the consequence that therefore um, eco economics is fundamentally different from physics, but certainly in methodological respects, um, uh, economics is in a somewhat unfortunate position. Um, or he says, the necessity of relying on uncontrolled experience rather than controlled experiment here you see the contrast between something like uncontrolled experience and controlled experiments. That uh, necessity makes it difficult to produce dramatic and clear-cut evidence to justify the acceptance of tentative hypotheses. Uh, this is, of course, um, what one thinks, many people at least, of physics, that in physics you have something like crucial experiments in which you can decide which of two um, uh, uh, com uh, competing hypotheses is the correct one. So this doesn't exist, and until the 1950s, people believed that didn't exist in economics. And experimental economics came into existence in the 1950s, more or less at the time when uh, um, uh, Milton Friedman wrote this sentence. And there were several factors involved in this emergence of uh, experimental economics. And they were fairly heterogeneous, but it's useful to know of them. The first thing was that uh, mathematicians were starting to play game theoretic problems from the 1940s on. Mathematicians are usually very playful and they play around you know, with ideas and things and here, game theoretic problems were something which uh, uh, drew the attention of mathematicians who worked in this area. So there was something, you know, with a game theory uh, going on, and that was closely in, that was closely related to sorts of experiments. Then there was an influence by psychologists, and psychologists starting to confront economic theory with experimental techniques from psychology. So, for instance, it was psychologists, not economists, who started to empirically investigate it, a bargaining behavior, and they did that by experiments and uh, experimental techniques um, were part of uh, psychology from the late 19th century on. So, um, it was not mainstream, absolutely, that it was experimental, well, it depended on the school where you were, uh, but certain parts of um, uh, psychology, of course, used experiments, and uh, such psychologists then started to investigate bargaining behavior. Then there is this famous economist, he also earned the Nobel Prize, Maurice Allais, the French uh, economist, and he sort of experimented and well, what he published then in 1953, and that became a very important tool for experimental economics, namely a discussion of imagined choices. And in uh, Maurice Allais case, you all know of uh, Allais paradox from 1953, these imagined choices led to results that were inconsistent with expected utility theory, the backbone of microeconomics. And finally, Vernon Smith, who earned a Nobel in 2002, began experimenting in 1956 on the question, how markets could approximate competitive equilibrium, of course, an important question uh, in economics. And uh, Vernon Smith started experimenting in the mid 50s. And these were four very important factors that influenced the emergence of exp experimental economics. Now, in the 1970s, experimental economics began to grow and develop really into a subdiscipline of economics. So one of these uh, important uh, points here is that Daniel Kahneman, Nobel 2002, and Amos Tversky began to collaborate and that led to the famous 1979 paper on prospect theory you're all familiar with and I discussed it already, at least some aspects of it. So that was a, a very important collaboration starting in the 70s. Another important collaboration with Reinhard Selten, 
who won the Nobel in 1994, and Werner Gut, who is well known for the, uh, as a co-inventor of the ultimatum game, began to collaborate also in, with um, experimental ideas. And then more and more within economics, more and more doubts came up, came up that human subjects really behave rationally in many situations. So the backbone, uh, the uh, expected utility theory that behaves, uh, that describes rational behavior and can be seen as a normative theory could also be, it was applied as a descriptive theory, but then doubts came up whether that is really an accurate and appropriate description of human choices. And then, which is always important uh, to look at if one asks when does a discipline or subdiscipline uh, emerge, uh, it look at the institutions, in university institutions and journals and such things, um, and uh, professorships uh, designated in that way. In the 1980s, the first institutions supporting experimental economics were indeed founded at various university institutes, journals were founded, etc. Now I have to come to a distinction that is very important in our context, namely the distinction between experiments versus observation. In the empirical sciences, sciences must use empirical data, clearly, because they can't simply speculate about theories and models. They have to use empirical data uh, about their relevant subject matter. Now, there are two principal options serving this epistemic purpose, namely the generation of empirical data, that is mere observation and experiment. And sometimes people are not very careful in distinguishing these two ways, and they simply speak about experiments sometimes in cases where it's really only an observation. Now, what is the principal difference between these two? Now, the principal difference between mere observation and experiment is that an experiment intervenes into course of events, into the course of events, and a mere observation does not. And in that sense, then, observation is passive. So when you observe an astronomical phenomenon by a telescope, you do not intervene into the course of affairs, but you just observe, take the data that you get from the object and somehow ob observe the event. Uh, of course, uh, an observation is not totally passive because usually you actively choose at what you direct your attention. Although sometimes uh, the phenomena are such that they direct you uh, to the phenomenon uh, that happened in some important cases in physics. Now, the question is, of course, what's the difference between data gaining by intervention and data gaining without intervention? Um, as it is the case in observation. Now, very roughly, and, but importantly, experiments can identify causal relations, whereas mere observations cannot identify causal relations. Now, in order to show you what is um, at stake here, imagine a situation in which two events or situations A and B are correlated in the sense Whenever there is A, then there is B. And that may be the result of an observation or of an experiment, whatever. Whenever there is A, then there is B. So there is a strong correlation between A and B. Now, if there is this regularity when A then B, we tend to assume that A causes B. This is something which is possibly even biologically inbuilt into our cognitive system. That's not quite clear, but uh, certainly we do have a tendency whenever we see B and afterwards, whenever we see A and afterwards B, then we tend to assume that A somehow causes B. However, there are four possibility how this correlation comes about. And uh, for all the empirical sciences, this is a fundamental a difference, and that's taught, of course, um, in the early uh, years of the undergraduate education, 
but uh, I've got to go through them again to make a, a clear what is really happening here. Now, the first possibility is that A really causes B, that B follows A because it is caused by A. And here is a simple example. So you smash a stone, uh, well, you don't do that as a student, of course. Say a stone is smashed into a window, and then B is that the windows breaks. And of course, we know that this is a causal connection because uh, throwing wind, uh, stones into windows may cause them to break. This is the property of glass in this particular constellation. So this is the easiest case. Um, then the second one is A is correlated with B, but not directly causally but via a common cause C. What does that mean? I'll give you an example. So we know that we have a correlation, or let's assume that this is um, a very good correlation, which it isn't, but let's assume it's a very good correlation, that we have a barometer reading falling. And then we have B, the event, uh, that is uh, the weather is deteriorating according to our human standards. And the point is that the barometer reading uh, that falls is certainly not the cause of the weather deteriorating, but it's an indicator for it. And if you look at the causal situation of the whole thing, then it's quite clear. It's a C, a low pressure system arriving. And that low pressure system arriving first causes the barometer reading falling, and then perhaps the next day, the weather deterioration. So there is a causal connection between all these three, but it's certainly not, not the case that A causes B. It's a common cause C that both causes A and causes B. Now, this is a very important case as well. Here are other cases. The correlation is accidental, but nevertheless projectable into the future. The correlation being accidental means that there is no causal chain connecting the two, neither directly nor indirectly. But nevertheless, it may be the case that you can project this correlation into the future. Look at the following example. Say we have A is a long-term increase of sea level, and say, let's talk about uh, from the 20th century on. And B, we have a long-term increase of bread prices, say, in Britain or wherever. And these events are indeed correlated. We do have both these things. So the long-term increase of sea level is correlated with the long-term increase of bread prices. But as far as we know, there's absolutely no causal relation between these two, two processes, neither directly nor indirectly. A and B have independently of each other and for completely different reasons, a tendency to increase. And of course, this tendency to increase is what makes the correlation. But again, there is nothing causal uh, involved here uh, in that correlation. And fourth, the fourth possibility, the most radical one, if you wish, it's that the correlation of A and B is utterly accidental and it is not um, projectable into the future at all. Now, I give you a very recent example, which has now, and there you see that the times have changed. The example is you have A is countries with left hand driving, and B is countries with a comparatively better coping with the corona crisis as of uh, March 16, 2010, 20. So those countries, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Japan, were doing best with the corona crisis. And you see immediately this is, these are countries in which you have left-hand driving. But obviously, there is absolutely no causal connection between these correlations. And also, they are not projectable, or they were not projectable into the future, because that quickly decayed, that correlation. But that may happen, and as long as the correlation exists, you may not know whether there is any kind of causal connection between these events or not. Now, the question is, of course, once we have these four different possibilities between correlations, 
how can we single out the causal connections? Because especially in economics, we are interested in the causal connections because we need causal regularities for policy influence. So if the policymakers ask the economists, uh, give us some um, uh, correlations or give us some connections between events such that we can make a certain policy, can implement a certain policy, the economist must deliver uh, causal connections as I explained in earlier sessions. Now, the safest way to single out causal connections is by an experiment, if the experiment is possible, of course. And this is by setting up the, from the two correlated things, the A part, the, the antecedent, and then if the correlation between A and B is really causal, then B will be produced. And B will only be produced if the connection is causal, of course. So if you take the barometer case, and you have a barometer with a pointer, then you can, of course, um, change uh, the pointer's position to a lower position. And then you may observe whether the next day the uh, weather will be deteriorating. And, uh, well, it may be deteriorating, but uh, if you repeat the experiment often enough, then you will see you will not change the weather development a bit by changing the barometer reading by moving uh, the hand of the barometer. So the point is then that the experiment is really the repeatable experiment uh, is uh, what singles out um, uh, causal connections. And it's very important in that context that it's the experimenter who chooses when to set up A and she or he can repeat the procedure. Because it could be, you know, that you have uh, this um, a causal connection of the second kind namely a common cause, um, and you don't know about it. But the point is because you choose when you set up A and you repeat that, then it becomes less and less and less likely that exactly at the same time when you choose to set up A, that also C, the, cause, the common cause, could be in place. And because you choose any time um, when you set up the experiment and set up A, then you become quite certain if you invariably produce B that there is a causal connection between A and B. And of course, uh, you have to have the, keep the environment constant and things like that. I will come back to that. So, uh, some authors believe that it's the only way to identify causal relations is by experiments. So there is disagreement in the literature about that and what kind of experiment. So uh, some authors believe it's the only way. Other authors believe there are other ways to identify uh, causality. And of course, what do you do when you cannot uh, set up an experiment? So for instance, uh, if you say uh, an eclipse of uh, the sun is caused by the moon's motion in front of the sun, and you say this is the real cause, then you cannot prove that by setting up an experiment and move the moon in front of the sun. We can imagine the experiment. That's not an experiment. Or it's an imagination of an experiment. Anyhow, in such cases, we do believe that the causality can be found out, found out by observation and plus theories. Uh, so it is difficult. It's really a, a tricky subject uh, whether in the final analysis it's only experiments that identify causality. And I don't want to go deeper into that. Uh, uh, that is a deep uh, controversy. Um, especially in economics, um, it's uh, hard to set up uh, e experiments in many cases that are policy relevant. Uh, but as I said, we need uh, a causal uh, correlations, causal connections to give policy advice. Um, and I explained that, as I said, in section one, in slide 29. Now, the next distinction between internal and external validity is an important distinction that was uh, introduced in psychology first. Uh, and then it was now, it is now used also in experimental economics and also in other disciplines. I think it's a, it's a useful terminology. And therefore, we have to understand what is going on? So the internal validity concerns the question whether the results of an experiment are valid 
for the experimental situation itself. So it means that am I sure that in the situation that I am investigating, this um, um, uh, experiment is indeed uh, valid in the sense that it's reproducible and I can be sure that uh, the, for instance, um, um, causal re uh, relation that is investigated really holds. Is the experiment reproducible is one of these fundamental questions that are important here in this context. Um, um, and uh, that is part of the investigation into the internal validity of the experiment. Are the experimental findings robust against the variations of variables that are deemed to be irrelevant? So this is also something that contributes to the answer to the question of internal validity. External validity, by contrast, is the question whether the results of the experiments are also valid outside of the experimental situation itself. Now, it really depends on the kind of experiment, what is meant by outside of the experimental situation itself. But it's quite obvious that when I know that in this particular experimental situation, I do have internal validity, that does certainly not guarantee that under other conditions, in a sense outside of the experiment, I will get the same results. And uh, I'll uh, uh, exp explain that in further detail now when I come uh, to uh, different experiments. Um, experiments, uh, are ex external validity becomes especially relevant when one extrapolates results from laboratory experiment to reality outside of the lab. And this is, of course, laboratory experiments are a very important kind of experiments. And uh, I come back to them and explain what, what that means. Um, but it's quite obvious already here, I guess, that questions of external validity are the central methodological questions of experimental economics, because in experimental economics, many experiments are really field experiments, uh, I'm sorry, uh, laboratory experiments. And then the question is, does that also um, apply then to the reality outside of the lab? Now, uh, economics is not alone with these um, uh, questions. There's a very similar distinction in biology and medicine between in vitro and in vivo experiments or in vitro experiments, in vivo experiments. Um, and uh, in vitro, within the glass, literally translated, means that the experiment is uh, conducted outside of the living organism about which I am talking. Uh, and in vivo experiments are experiments that use the whole organism. And that's very important because in many cases you start in uh, biology and medicine with in vitro experiments. And then the question is, does that really hold um, um, also for the organism itself? Um, and very often, unfortunately, is the case that the results from in vitro experiments cannot be extrapolated to the in vivo situation. 